What's up? What's up? This is Zach Boschman checking in. You're locked into the Sis and Truth podcast. We're honored today to have Danny Haifong on the podcast. The book is American Exceptionalism and American Innocence. He's the co-author and he's also a contributor to the Black Agenda Report. Danny, let's get right into it. There are a lot of Americans out there who believe the Trump era was an anomaly of sorts. They believe American presidents are generally good and acting in the best interests of the people at home and abroad. How does American exceptionalism and the presumption of American innocence contribute to this mentality? In so many ways, the United States has been dominated by a two-party duopoly since uh, its inception. And this duopoly the Democrats, Republicans, and their various shifting roles over the course of two plus centuries has really relied upon American exceptionalism to explain away its failures. Uh, We saw this quite clearly in 2016 when Bernie Sanders was attempting to shift the Democratic Party back to a prior period of the quote unquote New Deal and the Great Society and uh, essentially bring back this golden age, right, of American capitalism where the United States not only could be a world economic power, but also could meet some of the needs of some of its workers. Because at this time, that's just not the case, right? There is an economic crisis, there's a pandemic, there is so much chaos for workers and oppressed people both here and abroad caused by the United States. So American exceptionalism brings this system, this wholly uh, indebted system to capital at the expense of a working class people, um, a veneer of legitimacy, the idea that it is a quote unquote democracy that the United States' political model is the model that should be not just aspired to everywhere, but also enforced everywhere, right? The United States is known as the quote unquote world's policeman because it does over and over and over again, and case after case after case, more than 50 plus cases in the last 50 years, try to impose and a lot of times successfully impose its model Um, abroad in order to reap benefits for its uh, capitalist class, for its ruling class. And so the presumption of innocence really is connected to this because the United States does commit crimes against humanity. Its system is predicated upon them. And when you do this, when you have this long history of genocide and slavery and colonialism and imperialism, there is a need to justify the existence of these crimes, not just with the idea that the overall system is worthy of uh, striving for, but also in the fact that this system can make mistakes and then can be fixed, can be reformed. It's that contradiction of criminality and reform which is a tension across the United States' history, we try to portray this as a product, a a byproduct of capitalism, of imperialism, of white supremacy, of which American exceptionalism and American innocence are linked to. They are products of, they they cannot be separated from uh, because the consequences of these ideologies is really to mask, erase, and explain away all of the very real antagonisms, the very real roots of this society in the most heinous forms of oppression and exploitation. And we see now that the United States is on this uh, path of precipitous decline. We talk about Russiagate, but now China is the big story. We uh, really try to prove that the scapegoating of others abroad, of countries, of peoples, um, is really a byproduct of the scapegoating and the demonization and dehumanization of Black people, of Indigenous people here. You cannot disconnect 
those two realities in American exceptionalism and American innocence, these dual ideologies allow this system to thrive even amid and to survive really even amid some of the most disastrous crises that it has faced in um, its existence. I want to take the conversation uh, over to Palestine right now. In your book, you talk about how early on in the Black Lives Matter movement, organizers made their connection between their struggle with the struggle of the Palestinians. So I was wondering, how is the Israeli occupation of Palestine related to the American police occupation of communities of color? And maybe why should people who attended the, the George Floyd protests this past summer also stand in solidarity with Palestine? Well, that's a very good question. And, and there are so many components to it. So I'll, I'll try to explain a few. First, there is the parallel histories, right? While Black Americans in the mid 20th century were uh, talking about the United States as committing actual genocide, the Re We Charge Genocide petition that was submitted by folks like W.E.B. Du Bois, that petition made the claim and it's a very serious claim and it's a very legitimate claim that black people in the united states has been treated as a group that has been under occupation and that has been basically the victim of genocide because of the history of slavery and the realities of jim crow that really did characterize the situation the violence the um, economic disparities and the continued discrimination and segregation. And all of that we can see today with this new found opposition, this growing opposition to racist policing, to white supremacist policing, which policing in the United States is rooted in the slave patrols, it's rooted in the private armies and military and, and uh, uh, private military forces that were hired by corporations to put down workers uh, rebellions and, and worker actions that the police themselves in the United States actually train in Israel. So you have this situation where not only is there this parallel process happening, this, these two, these coexisting phenomenon where the United States funds Israel to the tune of nearly $4 billion a year to terrorize Palestinians militarily, to occupy, to throw them out of their homes, to imprison their children, uh, to you know, co commit indiscriminate bombings at any time. Not only that, but you have almost nearly daily police murders in the United States, a thousand per year, a disproportionate of them, nearly a quarter, if not more, Black American, that's going on while U.S. police departments are training in Israel. They are training. You actually in um, uh, confronted Andrew Yang about this recently, right? Yes, exactly. Andrew Yang was actually at Barclays, and I caught him off the train station. It was game one of the uh, Eastern Conference first round, Boston Celtics, Brooklyn Nets, and... I asked him if he was going to close what is a lot of people say is a small center in Tel Aviv that the NYPD holds, which conducts intelligence and uh, other information gathering on how Israeli police and how Israeli IDF forces uh, do their job. I asked him if he was going to end that given what he knew and given all of the, uh, all of the criticisms he has received uh, on this issue, on this question. And his answer was a non-answer. He avoided it. He just said, oh, I'm glad that the violence is dissipating and ending now and, and coming to a close, right? Because he has this canned response to this, the latest siege on Gaza. But the fact of the matter is, is what I was trying to portray was the fact that the United States' relationship, its influence on Israel and Israel's influence on the United States is so deep that now U.S. police departments are, and it's not just the NYPD, it's police departments all across the United States. They are training in Israel. And that's a byproduct of what we talk about in the book, the, um, 
the ten the the uh the program that the Pentagon funds, I believe it's the 1099 program, uh, which allows the Pentagon to get rid of extra armaments in the billions upon billions of dollars to you and get, provide them to U.S. police departments. So there is this militarization of the police that's happening um, year after year after year, of which Biden has increased by several millions of dollars just in his first uh, you know, in his first several months in office alone. So that, I think, really shows how there's a connection between Palestine and, the, and uh, the Black community here in the United States. And I think that that connection, we try to make this connection throughout the book, that that connection really goes beyond Palestine, too. I mean, Palestine is situated within this global reality of U.S.-led imperialism terrorizing the planet and without the foundations of the United States, without the immense wealth that was stolen from black people, without the immense wealth that was stolen from native people, from indigenous and the first peoples here, without that infrastructure, nothing the United States does abroad would be possible. There would not be an empire. The United States came out of World War II, as we talked about in the book, to claim its exceptional position, right? The apex of its so-called exceptionalism was after World War II. Well, the only reason that occurred, the only reason why there was this uh, huge shift uh, for the United States to become that global power was because the other European colonial powers had been uh, you know, torn asunder, by the two world wars, there was an economic crisis that the United States intentionally played ball uh, and stayed out of. They intentionally said, said we're, we're not gonna enter this conflict until it worked in the US's interests. And so the United States was able to then place the world economy under its heel. Uh, it, there was no longer any competitors and it wasn't until that time where after it built all of this wealth, right, the United States was the last country in the world to abolish slavery. After it built all of that wealth, it was able to then deploy it in ways that had not been seen before, right? All this new military technology and military investments that brought a lot of wealth back to the United States and did build this so-called quote unquote middle class, right? A lot of the worker strikes and labor actions benefited from the US's investments in war. And now we've seen kind of the conclusion of that, what that all brings now to humanity. It brings this endless war and endless austerity and it requires a, a real strengthening of this ideology because before American exceptionalism could, even though there was all of this uh, white supremacy, racism, endless wars happening, even in the mid 20th century, the United States could say, well, we have become the number one economy. We have brought all of these riches and this high standard of living to so many people. That is what makes the US exceptional and slavery and genocide and all of what it took to get there uh, is just a blemish on a, on a greater design, right? It's just a, another, it's just, one aspect of a journey toward a more perfect union. And we make the point that you can't separate mm -hmm. what was going on to black people at that time to what's going on to black people in this time. You can't separate what is happening abroad now, what the United States is doing in terms of its endless wars, its uh, cold war, new cold war on Russia to, you can't separate that from the mid 20th century and the 20th century Cold War that the United States led, you can't. And that's because there's continuity in the destructive path that the United States has led us to. And the only way we get out of that is challenging the ideological foundations from which that destruction really rests. If we don't do that, if we do not fess up to the truth of what the United States is, then we will be forever searching for reforms searching for changes and searching for a pathway uh, toward a legitimizing of this system rather than 
trying to figure out what new system, what new kind of way of life, what new kind of social order do we need to resolve these problems, to bring about an end to these problems and uh, really chart a path uh, to, to a, a more just situation, a more just social order. Danny, I wanted to bring up this quote that I really like from chapter 10. You say, quote, in short, Americans are consistently taught that social justice comes as a result of a benevolent CEO, president, senator, Supreme Court justice, or white abolitionist. I was wondering if you could elaborate on this as how it pertains to the racial justice movement, but also as it might pertain to the peace and environmental justice movements. Sure. Uh, there, are, there are so many instances of this because it's really how the narrative is written. It's how the script of the United States is written. The heroes that we are told to admire from childhood here in the United States are the oligarchs. They are those who charted the, the path that we find ourselves in that, that really did uh, drive in and run the engine of this society, which is capitalism, which is imperialism. So we celebrate the birthdays of slave owners like George Washington. Uh, the, we're taught that Abraham Lincoln was in fact the one who freed African slaves when there had been, as we cite Gerald Horn's uh, amazing book on the counter-revolution of 1776, there had been hundreds upon hundreds of slave rebellions, which really did bring forth the contradiction, the real grating contradiction, irreconcilable uh, contradiction that was this lust for more and more profit, which, me which meant more and more slavery, uh, while at the same time, uh, these slave masters, these planter class folks, they were worried about being beheaded. They were worried about what the consequences were of all of this. Uh, and, and that is true all the way into the Civil War, right? It was a war between capitalists. It was a war between factions of capitalists. And part of that war was driven by this economic problem. Do you want an expansion of this explosive uh, and, and this explosive situation, this explosive political economy, um, or, or do you not? And so, uh, you know, this is, these are the heroes that we're told to worship. We're told to worship uh, those folks like Thomas Jefferson. Um, uh, we're told uh, who, you know, owned many slaves, all nearly every U.S. president up until uh, about, you know, the formal emancipation of slavery owned slaves. Uh, and even today, right, even with this new kind of emphasis on diversity, the diversity is all predicated around positions of power. And it's all predicated around legitimizing the structures of power in the United States. So it's a celebration of the first black president, for example, even though the presidency is the commander in chief, which is in the top commander of the war machine and is the real, the ultimate general for that war machine and the blood that is on the hands of the US president after US president is well documented from the ongoing invasion of Syria and occupation of Syria uh, going all the way back to the annexation and colonization of Mexico and, um, uh, you know, and the Caribbean, et cetera. You know, we can go on and on and on. So the ramifications, I think, of this worship, this idealization and idolization of U.S. leaders in structures of power has created this aspirationalism, this American dream, which of course blew up uh, after World War II when the United States <laughs> kind of fell into uh, planetary wealth. It kind of fell into the majority of the wealth that existed on this planet. 
after the European powers were destroyed, the Soviet Union had a lot to rebuild because it was doing the bulwark. Uh, it was doing the grunt work of defeating Nazism and had to rebuild again. And uh, the United States created this American dream if out of that, to say that the United States is the society that can bring all your dreams and hopes and you can get rich quick and don't you don't have to worry about this racism thing because uh, you don't have to worry about uh, capitalism and exploitation any of that as long as you work hard and you do what you're supposed to do you don't quote unquote break the law you don't stand up for your rights you're going to get what you want which is a quote unquote middle class existence and so that i think that idea that ideology has stuck with a lot of people now we see in in folks like oprah and you know this this new emergent uh, class of uh, black uh, we call the misleaders at black agenda report uh, you see it in the entertainment industry you see it in the corporate media there is this aspirational uh, logic to the United States, to its empire, that allows it to uh, do what it does, that, that really justifies the existence of the massive amounts of poverty. It's not the fault of the system or the rulers of the system. It's the fault of those who weren't able to make it, like Oprah was able to make it. Uh, you know, these wars, right, they're they don't have anything to do with people in the United States because it's happening far, far away. And uh, if you don't, supposedly, if you don't want to fight in these wars, there's no more draft. So you can uh, kind of watch them from a distance. You can watch the drones fall. You can uh, hear about sanctions on the news as only being targeted at government officials in Syria or Venezuela. But we know uh, the reverse is actually true, that sanctions kill human beings they kill civilians and it's this consistent churning uh and pressure placed especially in a time of crisis especially under neoliberalism you have now this consistent pressure being placed both on the legitimacy of the ideology and on the need to legitimize the ideology of the american dream of american exceptionalism uh that you, we see the discontent the fact that majorities of uh, people in my generation, quote unquote, millennials, they want to see economic shifts in society. They want to see health care. They want to see guaranteed jobs. They want to see a Green New Deal. All of these things now are coming in co complete contradiction with the reality of society and the narratives that drive it. There's no longer any uh, alignment with this American dream and the reality for majorities of people. Now, Black people, even though they remain at the bottom rung of society, they're joined by nearly one out of every two people in the United States, right? So there is this great uh, race to the bottom. Yeah. And I think that makes it so there is even more celebrity worship. There's even more deifying. Joe Biden, for example, is now being deified. Uh, and that has to continuously happen because if it stops, then demands may be made on this system that just cannot be met. And that's the great kind of buffer ideologically that American exceptionalism uh, really serves to produce. Yeah, so we have, you know, that decrease in wealth, decrease in black wealth, especially, you know, the most uh, prisoners of, of anywhere, uh, these endless stupid wars, um, you know, uh, ratcheting tensions between Russia and China. Uh, what is the best way in 2021 to organize against the forces of American imperialism, American exceptionalism? and American innocence. And this would be the last question I ask you. Right, so I think that the best way to organize moving forward is uh, I think manifold. I think there are so many elements to it and I certainly don't have all the answers, but one of the missing components of 
organizing and mass movement politics here in the United States is a commitment to internationalism. And it's really hard, I think, for a lot of people to imagine internationalism in this period because of how effective the US war machine has been in propagandizing the population. We see anti-China uh, uh, sentiment at an all-time high. We see the new Cold War on Russia and China uh, be completely unchallenged by a, lot, a large part of the population. Uh, we see China being viewed as a threat and that even nearly half the country thinks that China should pay reparations for COVID-19 to the world and to the United States, despite the fact that China has done more to contain the pandemic and also help countries around the world than any other on this planet. So I think it's really important that as we continue to engage in our struggles, because we have to be honest. One of the reasons we wrote this book is to give an honest assessment of the current situation here in the United States, that the Occupy Wall Street movement and the Black Lives Matter movement and the Bernie Sanders upsurge and all of this has not created the kind of uh, political development and advancement that we truly need to, to ensure that the powers that be, that the ruling class feel compelled to even respond to the movement in kind. There has been very little in terms of victories, right? We haven't been able to place the kind of demands and see them through. Uh, the very few responses we get are ones that are wholly inadequate, like the police reforms that we saw after the first Black Lives Matter upsurge, right? There was body cameras, and uh, there, there, but there were still very few prosecutions of police officers and even fewer changes in the way of uh, decreases in, in, in police funding. And we saw a little bit more of that, but in the second iteration, but it's still wholly inadequate. And economically, uh, the working class in the United States hasn't seen a victory in nearly three generations. And so all of that is to say is that as we try to build and rebuild political organization driven by and led by people uh, of black led movements and liberation movements, uh, working class struggles. We have to have an international outlook and an internationalist outlook. We have to learn from movements before us that stood up to the Cold War. The black liberation movement in large part stood up to the Cold War and did not go along with anti-Soviet propaganda or anti-China propaganda. Uh, there was a lot of solidarity during that time period with both countries because there was this bond that was uh, evident, this kind of mutual situation that was occurring where the United States, as it was lynching and segregating and um, you know, brutalizing Black people, was also seeking to do that around the world and justifying it by crying about communism. And now we're in a very similar situation where China is being blamed, Russia is being blamed for all of the ills that the world is facing, including the United States. And it's very important that any movement that seeks change here in the United States does so with an eye on solidarity and efforts towards solidarity, because one of the central demands of this period is to defund not just the police, but the military, to ensure that the US military cannot be the super polluter and super murderer that it is on, uh, in this, uh, on this planet. And that cannot be done unless there is this understanding that the conditions that we face here, these very unexceptional conditions, the paycheck to paycheck for 80% of people, the fact that many people are avoiding healthcare, the homelessness that is rampant, uh, the stagnant wages, the mass incarceration, the policing, unless we connect that to the international situation what the U.S. does abroad, we won't be able to transform the society because the United States will redirect energy. We saw it with Russiagate. We, we see it with this new Cold War now on China. There's a redirection of energy toward blaming 
a foreign power outside of our control and our scope um, in order to maintain the legitimacy of this empire and to maintain the semblance of, of exceptionalism. Because when the United States says that China is committing all these horrible human rights atrocities with no evidence, it is also making the claim that the United States does not do that, right? And even if the United States has been put under a lens in terms of racist policing, mass incarceration, it, there is still this ability to claim that China is worse, Russia is worse, the DPRK, right? All the horrendously cartoonish portrayals of the DPRK or Cuba, right? That there are these parts of the world which are so far inferior to the United States that it gives credibility to what the United States is. And that thus further entrenches the system. And so our movements need to look at the international situation far differently because much of the left, unfortunately, and part of the reason we wrote the book was to address that a large portion of the quote unquote left has abandoned this principle of internationalism uh, which speaks volumes about where the entire society, especially the left, is in moving forward um, on issues of white supremacy, on the capitalism, and, and on these, this global system of imperialism that the U.S. leads. Danny, thank you so much for joining us. Make sure you get the book, American Exceptionalism and American Innocence. Thanks, man. Talk to you soon. Thank you. Appreciate it.